My name is Murray Armstrong. I'm the author of The Liberty Tree, the stirring story of Thomas Muir and Scotland's first fight for democracy. We're tonight having the fourth annual Thomas Muir Memorial Lecture. It was set up by the publisher of the book, by Ward Power. The, the very first lecture that we had was done by the former First Minister Alex Salmond. Uh, then we had Leslie Riddock the following year, and we had uh, Tommy Shepard, the, the SNP MP, uh, last year. This year we have a wonderful Gerda Stevenson, uh, whose book Quines uh, was published on International Women's Day this year. You probably know that Quines is an East Coast word simply meaning women, and the 68 poems uh, that she has in, in, in her collection uh, celebrate the voices of uh, women throughout Scottish history from the Neolithic times up until the present day. It's a fabulous collection of poetry and we're very excited to have Gerda here tonight in the Lighthouse Bookshop in Edinburgh uh, to deliver this fourth annual Thomas Muir Lecture. The name you gave me masks your fear. You paint my monster head so small, pea brain perched on a silly neck and give me a round wee wifey's belly. The real me strikes terror in your heart. My mind broad as your kyles, its levels layered as the cairn gorms. My paps slope with the grace of Jura their nipples bright as fresh water pearls, sleek hips fit for tender cargo. I carry all our stories from long before the Romans named the Picts, and I'll elude your sonar probes and camera clicks. I'll only rise when you can see beyond the surface, fathoms deep. <laughs> That's the first poem um, in the book. Well, second actually, because there is a prelude and um, an epilogue. In the year that marks the centenary of British women over the age of 30, securing the right to vote, I'm honored to be invited to give the Thomas Muir Memorial Lecture based on my book, Quine's Poems in Tribute to Women of Scotland. These women represent a wide range of eras, professions and social classes, singers, politicians, a fish gutter, queens, a dancer, a marine engineer, a salt seller, sports women, scientists, writers, painters, a fishing fly tire, and many more. There's a Skahach from the Isle of Skye, the warrior woman of legend who taught Cahoolan martial arts. There's a Viking, a Covenanter, a Jacobite, and on we go through the centuries to our own, the 21st. There's no hierarchy of achievement in these pages. I wanted to create a sense of a cross-section of female society. But tonight, I'm going to narrow it down. Part of the aim of the Thomas Muir Memorial Lecture is to promote awareness of social justice and democracy. So my focus here will be on the women from my Quine's collection who relate most closely, most directly to those themes. Like Thomas Muir, many of the women in my book, although by no means all, were well known in their time but were then written out of history. Some of them were never ever written in. So first, a bit of personal background. One aspect of being female is that whatever your occupation, you can easily become invisible. I founded Stellar Quine's Theatre Company in 1993 because I felt that Scotland's female theatre practitioners, particularly women of around 35 and over, were prone to this fate, invisibility. Prior to this, I'd worked with Monstrous Regiment, a London-based theatre company often referred to as the grandmother of British women's theatre. The company's name was, of course, taken from the title of a book written by John Knox in the 16th century, the first blast of the trumpet against the monstrous regiment of women. The monstrous regiment or regimen he was referring to being the female Catholic 
sovereigns of his day, Mary of Guise, the Dowager Queen of Scotland, who was regent to her daughter, Mary Queen of Scots, and Queen Mary I of England. At the time of working with Monstrous Regiment, I'd been employed around Britain as an actor for well over a decade. I remember how surprised I was. On the first day of rehearsals with this company, I looked around the room and saw only one man, an actor. All the other actors, the playwright, the director, lighting designer, set designer, stage management team, publicity admin, all of them were female. And this struck me as utterly extraordinary. And what struck me as even more extraordinary when I thought about it was my own surprise. I mean, I knew that Monstrous Regiment was a women's theatre company, so what had I expected? The reality of the situation initially felt uncomfortable because of its unfamiliarity. In many theatre companies, I'd often been the only woman or one of a small female minority, but I'd never experienced that gender ratio reversed. This experience got me thinking about the professional theatre scene here in Scotland, where I live. As far as I knew at the time, at that time, our only women's theatre company was Misfits, Misfits, uh, run by the excellent partnership of Rona Munro and Fiona Knowles, uh, Rona as playwright and Fiona as solo performer. I was in my mid-thirties by this time, had become a mother and was starting to write poetry. The majority of parts for women in most plays fell into this category, the glamorous young thing. I was, I was being offered um, fewer and fewer of the ingenue roles. And it seemed to me that just when women have earned the, um, some, some life experience, enabling them to contribute something of real value to the art form, the opportunities to do exactly that just melt away. I wanted Scotland to have its own monstrous regiment and I founded Stellar Quines and uh, stayed with the company for six years until it uh, got public funding. So a quarter of a century on, I'm glad to say it's still going strong. It takes a long time for history to alter its course and in the meantime, many significant women have been lost to us. Having had my first poetry collection published, I began to think about what shape my second one might take. And given the work I'd done in theatre with Monstrous Regiment and with Stellar Quines, an idea was subconsciously brewing. I'd been reading a fascinating book by Barbara Taylor, Eve and the New Jerusalem, about women who were influenced by Robert Owen, the utopian thinker. And I'd become interested in Fanny Wright, one of the women in that book, daughter of the Scottish Enlightenment, born in Dundee in 1795. So many extraordinary women from Dundee. And I don't know whether that's to do with the fact that they worked in the jute mills in a huge force for less money than um, men would be employed. And the men stayed at home and were known as the kettle bilers. Mm -hmm. And I think this gave the women, this is my theory, um, a sense of empowerment. Uh, there's a Dundee Women's Trail, there's the Dundee Women's Festival. They're an extraordinary bunch of women. Um, Fanny Wright, born 1795, was a writer, orator, feminist, abolitionist, a champion of workers and women's rights, an atheist, fearless critic of religious institutions and of the banking system. And here's what Fanny wrote about the Bank of England. A sort of hydra with many heads but one brain, and that brain ever working for the feeding of its own heads alone, at the expense of the whole mass of the nation on whom it preys. A monstrous creation which, either by force of arms, by treasonous practices, secret tamperings, bribery, hush money, diplomacy, palaver and mystification, has strangled the national independence and popular liberty of every state upon the globe. Its purpose would be, she said, the subjugation of the whole industry and credit of the civilized earth to one monstrous monopoly monarchy. And um, yes, has it changed? <clears throat> and here's Fanny on the injustice of the prevailing political system that rewarded jobs, which she described as the least 
useful, nay, frequently the most decidedly mischievous. The husbandman, who supports us by the fruits of his labour, the artisan to whom we owe all the comforts and convenience of life, are banished from what is termed intellectual society, and too often condemned to the most severe physical privations and the grossest mental ignorance, while the soldier, who lives by our crimes, the lawyer, by our quarrels and our rapacity, and the priest, by our credulity and our hypocrisy, are honoured with public consideration and applause. Fanny Wright was a rebel. And if Thomas Muir was deemed seditious, that's what he was charged with, sedition, that is using language and actions calculated to overthrow the government, then Fanny Wright was certainly following in that tradition. She moved to America and became the first female editor and publisher of a newspaper there, The Free Inquirer, along with Robert Dale Owen, Robert Owen's son. She was gloriously outspoken about the pleasures of sexual passion, which she refused to equate with shame. She saw the institution of marriage as a form of female slavery. She campaigned for birth control, divorce and property rights, which were denied to married women. Tragically, she married in the end an absolute rotter um, <laughs> because she became pregnant and she was, um, she, she was just very worried about the stigma. And of course it was a disaster. He took all her money and, um, I uh, don't really need to tell you anymore. I mean, you can guess. Um, she had a play produced on Broadway and thousands flocked to her lectures. She was greatly admired by Mary Shelley, who asked her for a lock of her hair, which she kept um, until she died. Mary Shelley kept that lock of hair. And Walt Whitman, who heard her speak, described her as one of the best in history, although also one of the least understood. When I was working in New York in 2012, I visited the Walt Whitman Birthplace Museum um, on Long Island. And as I stepped into the main room, the first thing I saw was a triptych of portraits. Whitman's mother and father, and between them, Fanny Wright, the three most significant influences in his life. Yet she was forgotten in her own lifetime, and she's now almost unknown. She eked out her final years in poverty, living alone in Cincinnati. I was imagining Fanny getting the news of Mary Shelley's death. I hadn't got a hook into this poem until I read that Mary Shelley had asked for this lock of her hair. Fanny Wright meditates on Mary Shelley's death. The news is through, sweet sister. You are dead. You kept the lock of hair from this tired head. Since that day we met, I'm told, said my curls and thoughts were like your husband's. So a churl I'd have been to deny you. We were young then and America was freedom's lung, I believed, when I asked you to sail with me to this land of the great liberty tree. But your heart was moored to old Europe's shore. Child of love and light, may your spirit soar and steer me onward, lead me through this mire which clags and drags my soul to a hell fire of self-doubt, that I have wedded the cause of human improvement and without pause staked my reputation, my whole fortune, my entire life on a wild, blind auction, bidding for an illusion and lost all. You knew my birthplace, Mary, and drank deep from the well of enlightenment. No sleep for our restless minds till democracy becomes reality, not prophecy. Yet that longed for state is more distant now, it seems to me tonight, than the bright plough ab high above Cincinnati's candlelight. Since you breathe no more, who cares what I write? or think, and why should they? Who can resist the weight of law and religion, the fist of finance that cloaks its blows with sweet bribes, until our brave new world and all its tribes are subjugated, lost, 
and tyrannized by cool monopolies that brutalize. And it goes on. Um, yes, the, um, I refer there to um, um, what's on her epitaph, um, which is, I have wedded the cause of human improvement staked on it, my fortune, my reputation, and my life. That's what's on her gravestone in Cincinnati. The uh, Child of Love and Light is a quote from Percy Bysshe Shelley's dedication to, to Mary in his poem, The Revolt of Islam. Um, a year or so after I'd learned about Fanny Wright, I was filming in Shetland, playing a part in the detective series of that name. And on a day off, I visited Lerwick's wonderful Shetland Museum. I discovered a young woman there. She was thousands of years old. And although I was looking at her reconstructed head with her skull lying next to it in this glass case, um, she, she, was, she, was, um, I just, she, was, um, she seemed more alive than anyone I'd met in a long time. I felt she could have been my, my daughter. Same colour of eyes and hair, same ski slope nose. <clears throat> Who was she? What language did she speak? Why did she die so young? They told us um, in a note next to her, her head that uh, she'd, they could tell from radiocarbon dating that she had died between the ages of 17 and 27. Does history separate us or does it reveal how much we have in common? I began to wonder whether I could write a poetry collection that would include this young Neolithic woman and Fanny Wright. I started ordering books. I used the Biographical Dictionary of Scottish Women, a brilliant resource, and it's about to go into its second edition this autumn. Everybody should have a copy on their shelf. It's fantastic. Um, I, but for in-depth reading, because that's just a dictionary, you know, with a little paragraph about each woman, I found that the books I needed were often out of print, invisible women. Yet many of them seemed so contemporary in their sensibilities and observations. Take Mary Somerville. In the book compiled by her daughter, Re Personal Recollections from Early Life to Old Age of Mary Somerville, this major international figure of science born in 1780 reflects on environmental issues which couldn't be more relevant today. Returning to the valley of her birthplace in the Scottish borders, Mary finds herself deeply perturbed to see the River Jed invaded, she says, by manufactories. There is a perpetual war between civilization and the beauty of nature, she comments. And in her ninth decade, Somerville writes on women's place in society, and you really sense her frustration. She writes, Age has not abated my zeal for the emancipation of my sex from the unreasonable prejudice too prevalent in Great Britain against a literary and scientific education for women. The French are more civilized in this respect, for they have taken the lead and have given the first example in modern times of encouragement to the high intellectual of the sex. Madame Emma Chenou, who had received the degree of Master of Arts from the Faculty of Science of the University in Paris, has more recently received the Diploma of Licentiate in Mathematical Sciences from the same illustrious society after a successful examination in algebra, trigonometry, analytical geometry, the differential and integral calculus and astronomy. You see, she was just so excited. She, you know, the, the, the frustration that this wasn't available to women. And when the First World War broke out, uh, France delivered for women again, this time for Elsie Ingalls, <coughs> taking her up on her inspired offer of the Scottish Women's Hospital, um, the first all-women mobile hospital unit. The British government's war office had turned down Elsie's offer with the words, good lady, <coughs> go home and sit still. <coughs> Elsie ignored this man's advice and approached the French government. On the 5th of December in 1914, the Scottish Women's Hospital was posted to Royaumont. Its heroic work soon expanded to the Balkans and Elsie was the first woman to be awarded the Serbian Order of the White Eagle. In Serbia, where there's a monument to her 
and the Scottish Women's Hospitals, she holds the status of heroine. She's known there as our mother from Scotland. Another remarkable woman who received the same award for service with the Scottish Women's Hospitals, that's the uh, Order of the White Eagle from Serbia, was doctor and psychiatrist Isabel Emsley Hutton. In her fascinating autobiography, Memories of a Doctor <coughs> in War and Peace, she laments the potentially devastating effects of the marriage bar, a common practice which prevented women from working in their chosen professions after they'd married. In this way, many brilliant women were excluded from the network of professional life, their careers losing momentum. And one notable case was the artist Dorothy Johnson, whose paintings were shown as part of the beautifully created, curated exhibition, Modern Scottish Women, Painters and Sculptors. I don't know if any of you saw that at the National Gallery of Modern Art in, uh, a couple of years ago, a real eye-opener. Um, the marriage bar was, was finally lifted in Scotland at the end of the Second World War, having done its work in relegating thousands of women to oblivion. But the culture of exclusion still continued, uh, as the artist Christian Small discovered when she applied for her first professional post in the late 1940s. This is after the marriage bar has been, um, been lifted, and she wasn't even married at this point. She'd just graduated with honours in chemistry uh, from St Andrews University. She got an interview, and when she turned up for it, the company realised they were dealing with a woman. She was called Christian. Um, a male or female name. They'd obviously assumed the, the, the name Christian referred to a male. She received a letter of rejection with the unforgettable words, we regret your sex. <laughs> and she kept that letter all her life. Um, there is a, a fantastic exhibition of her work at the moment, which is on in Peebles at the Chambers Institution. Um, and it's on till the 2nd of September. She gave away most of her paintings. She occasionally sold one for two and six, whatever, and uh, kept a huge stash of them in her children's cot, in her tiny cottage. They were there when she died. But my aim in writing this poetry collection isn't just to highlight injustices. I wanted to celebrate achievements and to explore the richly diverse contribution that women have made to Scottish history and society. Several of my Scottish-born quines made their mark abroad, like Fanny Wright, for example. Others, like the 16th century calligrapher, Esther Ingalls, a Huguenot refugee, came from elsewhere and made Scotland their home. We owe a huge debt to immigration. The slave trade, a debt, is incalculable. We're still witnessing the legacy. Windrush. What a scandal. It seems to have dropped off the radar. And that statue of Henry Dundas, <laughs> Home Secretary in Thomas Muir's time, Dundas the man who controlled virtually every cog in the nation's political machinery, up to his neck in corruption, blocking abolition for decades, yet his statue is still lording it here in Edinburgh, towering over St Andrew's Square. Let's talk about statues for a, a moment. The debate about them tends to be simplistically <coughs> binary. It's either tear down these offensive symbols of the British Empire, the image of them crashing down like Saddam Hussein's one did, or, or leave them up uh, with a wee disclaimer plaque. But couldn't there be a third way? Nick Green, the feminist theatre maker, proposes a kind of guerrilla tactic, sneaking out while no one's looking. Not quite sure how he could do that with Lord Dundas. <laughs> <laughs> and dressing the nation's statues, virtually all of them men, in frilly tutus. <laughs> Maybe. Satire's, satire's always a good ploy. But why can't we just remove these offenders without smashing them up. Lord Dundas, for example, put him in a museum and have his infamous story printed next to him for all to read and then put someone in his place in St Andrew's Square, a worthy woman. How about 
Eliza Juner. I think she'd be a really interesting candidate, given Dundas's enthusiasm for slavery. I discovered Eliza Juner in an article in the um, Inverness Courier. She was born in Demerara in 1804, and she died in Fort Rose in 1861. She was the daughter of Hugh Juner, a slave owner from the Black Isle, and an unknown mother, probably a slave. She won a prize for penmanship at Fortrose Academy, age 12. And I thought that merited a poem. Um, that was an achievement. Demerara, I've learned my letters well. My copperplate masts and sails flow across the page like the ship that carried us here, my brother and me, to our father's land, the black isle of white people, where I'm glad no cane grows. My mother always said I had a way with words. Demerara, river of the letterwood, its banks of trees with bark like hieroglyphics, a whisper in my ear from birth. Demerara, Demerara. I wish she'd lived to see my prize for penmanship, that I could tell her we are well and freed, that we don't heed the taunts of half-breed, octoroon, mulatto, quadroon. The Domini's wife says tawny, told me she'd seen some in Cromarty too, had heard rumours there were others come to Inverness and Tain and saving present company, wasn't it a shame that Scotsmen didn't refrain from relations with slaves? She was pouring tea and her spine stiffened in her corset when I declined the sugar. But it's Demerara, she crooned, it'll make you feel at home, and spooned it into my cup. I watched the gold beads, hybrid jewels, my father calls them, melt in the peat brown pool. Um, there were, thank you. There were lots of um, plantation owners in, in the Highlands and well, all over the all over the UK, and we are absolutely up to our necks in. Um, the uh, slave trade. In giving voice to my quines, I'd, I'd had to consider Scotland's three languages, Gaelic, Scots and English. And writing this book, I had to take this on board. Religion has influenced Gaelic and Scots and English. Mary Slessor, for example, was born in, um, in Aberdeen, but brought up in Dundee, another Dundonian, and lived most of her adult life in Nigeria. She was fluent in the Ethic language and spoke with a strong Scots accent, in fact often in Scots, and um, as did another missionary, Jane Haining from Dumfrieshire, who was also a linguist. I was born and raised in the Scottish borders and grew up hearing Scots spoken in my home village at, uh, at school, um, and uh, I love the language. I absolutely love Scots. Um, it's, it's range, it's, it's so tender and so visceral. Um, so there's about a third of the poems in the book are in Scots. Somebody said to me at one point when I was writing the book, how many poems are you going to have in Scots? You need to watch it, you know. I mean, people might not... This is Anna Buchan, uh, a zoologist and geologist born in Rose Harty, Aberdeenshire, 1897, and she died in Aberdeen in 1964. She was the curator of Marshall College Museum, Aberdeen, and Elgin Museum, writer of scientific articles. Um, she, um, I read her obituary in the Press and Journal, and um, I thought I'd invent a voice for this person um, for, to, to commemorate her. And it's, it's an invented voice of a granny, 
and I'm imagining her granddaughter coming home from college. It's the 1960s and the granddaughter's feminism is awakening. And um, the granddaughter's come in and uh, she's outraged by having read this obituary. So here we are in the granny's voice, Anna Buchan's obituary. Yon woman was something else. I mean, the headline they printed in the paper yestreen when she'd pecked her last. Didn't he give us a clue? My granddaughter bringed in for the college. She's eye foo at all kind of bio-ordinar facts that leave me a hint, particular new my mindin's tint. Apparently, says Susie, yon woman can't awe about yerd and what's bury it in it. Fossils like the rig bane are fit done to a bird. And all kind of gear, quays, ashets, bines for lang sign, she hoped to to win of them between the railway line and Elgin Road. Mind where the old clay pits yins were worked? My brother's bits are still clattered with on. And there's nothing she didn't ken about lamps. Tillies, cruises like I used to burn Ben. Yin for reed clay, says Susie, for the Nile. Thousands of years sign, fair fan touche in style. In story museums, she'd scan and leet alphabet thing, nay meter, whether talker or pauper or king. And she kenned all thing about the mountains or ice afore beasts were born. Could look at a slice o' yard and gee its name, date and place on our planet. She wasn't just a pretty face. <laughs> and here's Susie's pint. She's bailing o'er lass. This is the headline that come to pass abin her obituary. The bra woman, bless her, widow of an Elgin hairdresser. <laughs> <laughs> Now that's true, every word of that poem is true. And that was the headline in her obituary. Um, so, um, thinking of this thing of, uh, the, the other reason I read that is because, you know, this theme of um, defining women in terms of men all the time, you know, it's just, it drives you mad. And um, I mean, one of them is Jenny Lee. And people go, oh, yes, the wife of, and I say, no, 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 we're not going there. She was the architect of the Open University and the Arts Council. She wasn't the wife of. So um, here's Jenny Lee. I, this poem is in the voice of the Open University, which she called her wee bastard. <laughs> Um, she didn't have children, so this was her child, she felt. And I thought it was just so ironic that Jenny Lee, the architect of the Open University, which um, um, was initially named by Harold Wilson as the, of the, as the University of the Air, um, that Jenny Lee actually came from Loch Gelly in Fife, where the Loch Gelly Taws was made. You know, they, they whipped kids with those horrible leather things that were exported all over Scotland. And uh, to, to give you education, I tell you, you know, I tell you. Um, so beating education into you. So this is the Open University speaking. I am Jenny Lee's Open University. My wee bastard, she'd whisper, stroking the white paper that had my life laid out before the faithless members. There's plenty want to see you dead in my waters, but I'll be mother and midwife and you will thrive. We were made for each other, long before she knew it. Daughter of Loch Gelly, coal and leather, families broken by the general strike, the town whose slit tongued taws whipped bairns palms in bleak schools exporting the weapon to all the arts inert strips of tanned hide buffed to a shine and proudly stamped with their maker's name widowed by 60 and nothing to lose she gives me her all only the best is good enough she declares my champion in parliament's hallowed halls a challenge to their gilded ranks hope and hokum they howl it'll never catch on dad wheels into her memory on his bike 
from fifes, mines, laden with laundry and food to keep his lass at her studies in the capital. Through me, she swears she'll honour him and Hardy's Jude, his unbearable fate. Lift the have-nots from obscurity by releasing knowledge like caged birds into the air. And look at me now, her only child, the wee bastard she dared to nurture. How I've grown. <laughs> Um, the um, reference to Thomas Hardy's novel Jude the Obscure, one of my very, very favourite novels, um, I learned was, was, um, was also Jenny Lee's, um, one of her favourite uh, novels. She said that it was one of the most informative books for me when I was a young student, the struggle for self-education in circumstances of poverty. Where the voices in this poetry collection are or Gallic, I've attempted to suggest the language with a hint of its syntax in English and have used some Gallic words here and there. Although I'm married to a Gale and I'm familiar with Gallic, I don't speak it with any fluency. I can manage sort of tea and coffee and shopping and weather Gallic, but <laughs> not enough to write a poem. Um, Margaret Fay Shaw was an absolutely wonderful woman who um, who who came from America, from Pennsylvania, and um, wrote an absolutely brilliant book. Well, she didn't. It wasn't written. It was one of those verbatim books. She she collected the material from the uh, people of South Uist. The folk the the folk songs and folklore of South Uist is a fantastically significant book in its field, and. This generation of people, in the, it was published in the 1950s, that um, she was collecting from. This was the generation who couldn't, were illiterate in, in the language because, of course, the la language was banned in schools. And uh, um, since Culloden's time, it, was, it had, it had um, uh, suffered desperately. Um, and she, um, she gave this back by learning the language, an American, coming with her camera, a young woman, um, she was inspired, and um, she, she's a very, very important um, uh, person. I haven't time to read all these poems um, and, um, and tell you about every woman in the book. Um, I would love to. Um, and um, in that poem, um, it's the, in the voice of Marie-Andre McRae, one of the two women that she lived with in, the, in a croft, two sisters, for five years and learnt the language. I felt, having read Margaret Fay's um, autobiography from the Alleghenies to the Hebrides, brilliant book, um, that she wouldn't really have spoken about herself, I think, um, in a poem, not in the way that I could find anyway. Um, she was a great character. She, she used to say, never say die, say do. <laughs> um, uh, so I, I, I gave the voice to Marie Andra who is a Gale. Um, I was, um, she, of course, Mariandra, was deeply religious. There are lots of very religious women in this book. And I learned quite a lot about religion in the process because, of course, most people were religious. Um, and um, Helen McFarlane, the Chartist revolutionary, um, the first translator into English of the Communist Manifesto, admired hugely by Karl Marx. Um, she saw Christ as a manifestation of the democratic principle. And she wrote, I think one of the most astonishing experiences in the history of humanity was the appearance of the democratic idea in the person of a poor, despised Jewish proletarian. The Galilean carpenter's son who worked probably at his father's trade till he was 30 years of age and then began to teach his idea wrapped in parables and figures to other working men, chiefly fishermen, who listened to him while they mended their nets or cast them into the lake of Gennesaret. Do you understand now, says Helen, the meaning of the words democratic and social republic? They are the embodiment of that dying prayer 
of our first martyr, that all may be one, even as we are one. While Helen McFarlane's Christianity was um, a compassionate one, um, psychiatrist Isabel Emsley Hutton comments on the effects of fundamentalist Protestantism in her autobiography, which I've mentioned, Memories of a Doctor in War and Peace. And she says, children in my day were brought up on the maximum of Christian terror and the minimum of Christian love. It is indeed not too much to say that many Scottish children went through a mild conflict which might almost be termed religious melancholia before their first decade of life and that some carried their guilt and fears with them into adult life. I think that's a very interesting comment. In selecting my quines, I wanted to represent a wide range of constituencies. As the mother of a daughter who has Down syndrome, I'm keenly aware of the marginalisation of people with disabilities. And through my researches, I discovered the activist Margaret Blackwood, another Dundonian. Her story is remarkable. I'll read you my poem for her. It takes quite a bit of digging sometimes to find if you're looking for a particular constituency, which I was doing at times. Uh, but I didn't write about anybody that I felt I couldn't get a hook into for a, a poem because obviously the, it's a book of poetry um, and the poem, it had to be something I could write a poem about. This is Margaret Blackwood and her lobbying, she was, she was a campaigner for disabled people's rights, her lobbying inspired by Megan de Boisson resulted in the 1970 Chronically Sick and Disabled Persons Act leading to the introduction of benefits such as mobility and attendance allowances. Very, very important woman. All it takes. Learn to knit, they said, the stale air thick with the syrup of pity dripping about my wheelchair. I used to leap upstairs, two at a time, more dear than girl, till pain scorched my tendons and the years like my limbs wasted away or make lampshades they'd say i tried the watchmaker's trade and failed time trickled through my fingers cogs and wheels faltering miniature pinions barrels and ratchets scattered to the floor in fragments of rage yet all it takes is a scrap of news a lifeline buried in the small print. Someone out there, like me, but she's not going down. Megan de Boisson has a plan. Time becomes an oasis, no longer a wasteland. I'll not wait to die, as they predict, a bedridden heap in that vamped up poor house at Logie rate, where ghosts stir under the wallpaper and whisper their plea to a careless world. Are we a dirty word? I'm leading the protest down Princess Street, wheelchair battalions spinning like clockwork at dazzled cameras in the sun. Trafalgar Square next, if they won't hear our cry. We exist. I'm riding the way for change. These women gathered experience and wisdom against, against great odds and were more often than not excluded from participation. This year also marks the centenary of the end of the First World War. So I'd like to finish this evening by talking about the barrister and pacifist Crystal Macmillan. She was born and died in Edinburgh. She was a UK representative at and organiser of the Women's Peace Congress convened at The Hague in 1915. She was also one of the organisers of the International Committee of Women for Permanent Peace. The ICWPP had planned to meet in Paris at the same time as the official peace conference was being convened <coughs> at Versailles in 1919. But women delegates from central powers, that's the enemy powers, and they were part of this inclusive women's 
um, organization were not permitted to travel in France. So the ICWPP met in Zurich, just as the Treaty of Versailles was published. Shocked by the terms of the treaty, the women drew up a resolution and sent a telegram to members of the peace conference in Paris. And this is the telegram that they sent to the men who were the victors who were drawing up the Treaty of Versailles, who had drawn it up. This International Congress of Women expresses its deep regret that the terms of peace proposed at Versailles should so seriously violate the principles upon which alone a just and lasting peace can be secured and which the democracies of the world had come to accept. By guaranteeing the fruits of the secret treaties to the conquerors, the terms of peace tacitly sanction secret diplomacy, deny the principles of self-determination, recognize the rights of the victors to spoils of war, and create all over Europe discords and animosities which can only lead to future wars. The women of the ICWPP were not only excluded from playing what could have been an effective part in determining the course of history. Their advice and warnings were ignored at the world's peril. We can't afford not to hear from those representing half the human race. And I'm going to finish with my poem for Crystal Macmillan. She was known as the Scottish Portia. Apparently she was a brilliant speaker. I never played Portia, the um, part I would have liked to have played. So I was thinking about the quality of mercy is not strained, it droppeth as the gentle rain from heaven upon the place beneath that is twice blessed. Um, when I wrote this poem, justice, persons and peace. The meaning of justice is our refrain. If half of humankind is erased from its scales, the word can hold no weight. Its essence ever bears a twofold freight. Those who make our loaded laws say only persons can participate in shaping the governance of state. By common concord, the Lords maintain a person is de facto male. Thus they relegate half the value of yet another word to the same obliterated fate. And what of the single syllable, peace, that renders those who make it blessed, so strong, yet misconstrued as weak, violated at Versailles by vengeful victors who deny its power to release the world from future war? The one word women called for in Congress, at The Hague, that syllable whose meaning must not drop so slow it won't be felt or sought. Hear this. In the name and face of justice, we are persons, half the human race, and will advance our urgent plea for peace. We will persist. Thank you very much. <laughs>